our tea party. Hi everyone, and thanks for tuning in. This is an introductory video on vent settings made for new RTs, nurses, resident physicians, medics, and anyone else who might find themselves caring for patients on mechanical ventilation. I found that most videos out there on vent settings tell you that A equals B and C equals D, but there's very little Y behind it. So in this video, which is meant for people learning vent settings for the first time, I'll try to make it as easy as possible to conceptualize, understand, and apply your practice. So the main four settings for a volume control ventilated patient are tidal volume, sometimes represented as VT, respiratory rate, which is represented as RR or F for frequency, PEEP, or positive end expiratory pressure, and FiO2, which means fraction of inspired oxygen. Now there are many different types of modes, some of which come with settings different than what you see here. For example, pressure control substitutes a pressure for a volume, or smart modes might have ideal body weight or a percent minute ventilation, a spontaneous breaths may have pressure support, or bio level may have a time high and a time low. These will be covered in another video, but for the most part, there's a high chance that your intubated, sedated patient will be on some form of volume control which have these four settings here. So let's go over each one of them and what they mean. Now it's important when learning mechanical ventilation to understand the idea of oxygenation and ventilation, which may sound similar at first, and they are. You can't oxygenate without ventilating. You can't get O2 to your tissues without contracting your diaphragm to breathe. However, when it comes to learning mechanical ventilation and making changes based on ABG results, it's important to distinguish the two from each other. To distinguish the two, let's first review some biochem. So why do we ventilate and why do we oxygenate? Recall how the cell makes energy through the central metabolic pathway from glucose to ATP. In glycolysis, glucose first is oxidized to pyruvate, which goes through decarboxylation to make acetyl-CoA, which then enters the Krebs cycle and produces NADH and FADH2. Now these two molecules serve as electron carriers in oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria to create a proton gradient that serves as the force for the phosphorylation of ADP and the production of ATP through the enzyme ATP synthase. And in order for this reaction to occur, these electrons need somewhere to go, and a highly electronegative diatomic molecule like oxygen is a perfect acceptor. So without O2, oxidative phosphorylation and efficient ATP production stop. Okay, that explains why oxygenation is important, but what about ventilation? Now I'm using the diagram here that I made from an old biochem class, so there's a lot of extra detail, but I'll highlight the important parts. So during many of these steps, CO2 is formed as a byproduct. This is because glucose, which starts off as a six carbon molecule, one, two, three, four, five, six, it eventually gets broken into a three carbon molecule, pyruvate. Now pyruvate loses a carbon during conversion to acetyl-CoA in the form of CO2 that we eventually exhale. A carbon is lost again in the Krebs cycle during oxidation of isocitrate to alpha-ketoglutarate, and a third carbon is lost in the oxidation of alpha-ketoglutarate to succinyl-CoA. So that's three carbons from pyruvate accounted for in being lost as CO2. Now because two pyruvate are actually made from one glucose molecule during glycolysis, those three CO2 molecules are multiplied by two to yield six CO2 that's actually produced as a byproduct of glucose metabolism. This is why the overall equation for cellular respiration is C6H12O6, or glucose, plus 6O2 that we breathe in, yields 6 water molecules and 6 CO2 molecules that we breathe out. This is probably the equation that you're the most familiar with. Now, why is this important? Why did I go over this when other vent setting videos on YouTube don't? Why go into so much detail? And it's really to illustrate the fact that O2 doesn't just get converted to CO2, which is often how it's explained in layman's terms or in basic physiology courses. Although the production of CO2 and the consumption of O2 happen at the same time, they occur at completely different places along the central metabolic pathway, as you just saw. In other words, we can't treat oxygenation, which is O2 inhalation, and ventilation, which is CO2 exhalation, as the same thing. They're measured independently in blood gas analysis, and really, they should be treated independently through proper manipulation of vent settings. Now let's revisit our four basic vent settings, tidal volume, respiratory rate, PEEP, and FiO2. Now that we've discussed the differences between oxygenation and ventilation, know that tidal volume and respiratory rate both affect ventilation, or CO2 removal, while PEEP and FiO2 both affect oxygenation, or O2 intake. Now although later, more advanced topics can reveal that this may not always be true, just know that when beginning to learn vent settings, this holds true most of the time.
So first, let's visit tidal volume and respiratory rate. Why do these both affect ventilation more than oxygenation? It's because the partial pressure of CO2 in the blood is inversely proportional to a term called minute ventilation, often abbreviated as VE. Now, minute ventilation, by definition, is the amount of gas that is breathed in and out of the lungs in one minute. And it makes sense. The more we breathe, the more CO2 we exhale, and the less that remains in the bloodstream. Now, I usually find that when explaining this concept to nurses, medics, and new residents, comparing minute ventilation to cardiac output makes things really easy to understand. So what's the equation for cardiac output? It's the amount of blood pumped in one heartbeat, or stroke volume, multiplied by the number of heartbeats per minute, and that equals your cardiac output. If you want to increase your cardiac output, what do you do? There's no medication given to directly increase that output, since it's a product of two different variables. But you could give a positive inotrope, such as dobutamine, to increase the stroke volume, or you can give a positive chronotrope, such as isoproteranol, to increase the heart rate, or you can give a medication that's both a strong inotrope and chronotrope, such as epinephrine. All of these would give you the same effect of an increased cardiac output. Now with ventilation, instead of a stroke volume, you have a tidal volume. Instead of a heart rate, you have a respiratory rate. And instead of a cardiac output, you have a minute ventilation. But the units are all the same. MLs for stroke volume and tidal volume, BPM for beats per minute or breaths per minute, and liters per minute for cardiac output and minute ventilation. To make things even easier, the normal values for cardiac output and minute ventilation are the same, which is roughly 5 to 8 liters per minute. But the same concepts still apply. If you have an elevated CO2, you don't want to get in the habit of jumping to increase the respiratory rate or the tidal volume, because based on the patient's ongoing pathophysiology, pulmonary history, lung compliance, fluid balance, airway resistance, and other variables, one setting may be preferred over the other. The habit you want to get into saying is that you want to increase the minute ventilation. And how do you do that? Through manipulation of tidal volume or the respiratory rate. So now that we've covered the first two, which both deal with ventilation, let's move on to oxygenation. The fourth setting, FiO2, is a fairly easy concept to grasp, so let's do that one first. FiO2 stands for Fraction of Inspired Oxygen. It's expressed as a percentage, and it's just like what it sounds, the percentage of gas that you're delivering that's comprised of diatomic oxygen. Recall that normal atmospheric or room air has about 78% nitrogen and only about 21% oxygen, while argon, CO2, and other trace elements make up that final 1%. Now, why is it important to understand this concept? Recalling physics, Dalton's law states that in a mixture of non-reacting gases, the total pressure exerted is equal to the sum of the partial pressures of the individual gases. So if the pressure in a container of room air is 100 millimeters of mercury, then you can expect it to be about 78 millimeters of mercury of nitrogen and 21 millimeters of mercury of oxygen. If the pressure of that container were to double to 200, you'd follow Dalton's law and you can expect to have double the nitrogen at 156 millimeters of mercury and double the oxygen at 42 millimeters of mercury. Now at sea level, the atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury, so you can expect your 21% of oxygen to equal about 150 millimeters of mercury after accounting for water vapor pressure. Now at the top of Mount Everest, which is 29,000 feet above sea level, the atmospheric pressure drops from 760 to about 250, and the partial pressure of oxygen available for the lungs drops to only 43 millimeters of mercury. This is why you hear of climbers needing supplementary oxygen, or why some athletes choose to train at elevation for a harder cardiovascular workout. This concept comes into play if you're working or living at elevation in a place like Denver or Albuquerque, or if you're working as a flight nurse or a medic and you're finding yourself having to adjust your oxygenation in the air. So now that we've covered FiO2, the final setting is the one that often causes the most confusion. This setting is called positive end expiratory pressure, or PEEP. So basically, during mechanical ventilation, there's a pressure during inhalation to deliver the target tidal volume, but when the ventilator switches to exhalation, the airflow in the ventilator circuit doesn't shut off completely. Instead, there's a baseline flow being maintained through the breathing circuit, flow that creates a back pressure while the patient exhales. Now, to someone new to mechanical ventilation, this might actually sound a bit counterintuitive. I know it was for me when I was first learning. So how will providing back pressure actually make breathing easier? So the short answer that's almost always given is that back pressure splints the airways open or it keeps the alveoli inflated, which increases surface area to volume ratio, allowing for better oxygenation. And these answers aren't wrong. It's certainly the case with BiPAP or CPAP uh, during dynamic airway collapse and COPD or airway obstruction and sleep apnea. However, when you're dealing with patients on mechanical ventilation, the concept is actually a little bit more in depth. 
After all, you've probably seen ARDS patients with extremely high PEEP settings of 15 or 18 or higher, and surely all that pressure isn't just to splint the alveoli open. So what's actually going on at the molecular level? It's an increase in pressure leading to an increase in oxygen gas solubility. So let's go over another physics concept. It's called Henry's Law. Henry's Law states that the amount of gas dissolved in a liquid is directly proportional to the partial pressure of that gas above the liquid when it's kept at a constant temperature. So what does that actually mean? Let's picture a 2 liter bottle of soda, or pop if you're watching from the east coast. You pop open the cap, and if you leave it uncapped it's flat in just a few hours. Now when a soda is going flat, what's actually happening? Well, carbon dioxide, which is dissolved in the liquid when the soda is packaged, stays dissolved in the liquid due to Henry's law. When the bottle is sealed, the container is pressurized with CO2 to roughly 2.7 times normal atmospheric pressure, which is about 40 psi or about 2,000 millimeters of mercury, depending on the units that you want to use. So as long as the pressure directly above the liquid is maintained, CO2 stays dissolved. But when we open the bottle, and the gas above the liquid is now at a lower pressure, atmospheric pressure, According to Henry's law, since the partial pressure of the gas above the liquid has dropped, the solubility of the gas in the liquid has dropped as well. And you see this happening in real time as CO2 bubbles that were dissolved now start to form and make their way to the surface. Now keeping this principle in mind, consider instead of the gas above the soda pop you have pressure in the alveoli, and instead of the soda pop you have blood in your pulmonary capillaries. Now you can see that as the average pressure in the alveoli, known as a mean airway pressure, is increased, more oxygen molecules in the alveoli can now cross the thin alveolar capillary membrane and dissolve into the bloodstream. And the fastest way to increase main airway pressure, which can be represented as the area under this pressure curve, is by increasing the baseline pressure. This is known as the positive end expiratory pressure. And that right there is the scientific explanation for why increasing PEEP improves your oxygenation. You really want to keep in mind your hemodynamics. You'll hear about PEEP actually affecting your hemodynamics for this reason, as you increase the PEEP, you're increasing your intrathoracic pressure, and because gas is a fluid, the fluid's going to follow the path of least resistance, and it's going to push on the most compliant parts of the intrathoracic cavity, and most of the time, this is going to be your inferior and superior vena cava. It's going to collapse those, it's going to decrease your venous return, which will in turn decrease your cardiac output, and that's why you see blood pressure start to drop as you increase your PEEP. So you want to be cognizant of this, you want to keep an eye on your mean arterial pressure, your systolic pressure, and titrate your pressors and your fluids up as necessary to maintain your cardiac output that is dropped as a result of the increased PEEP, as a result of your increased oxygenation deficit. So there you have it. You have four basic vent settings, the ones that you'll be giving and receiving and report most of the time. Your tidal volume and your respiratory rate together make up your minute ventilation and address CO2 and acid-base imbalance. And your PEEP and FiO2 together make up oxygenation and address problems with saturation and hypoxemia. So thank you very much for watching. Please like, subscribe, and comment with any future topics that you'd like to see.